maybe 45 minutes or so about some of these ideas, talk about six different ways we can become long-term thinkers. And when we'll have plenty of time for conversations and questions. Um, as I'm talking, please feel free to write comments or questions in the uh, chat box. That would be really great. Um, I think I just heard someone's got their, their, mic, their, their microphone on, which needs to be muted. Um, that would be good. So let me begin um, by saying that, well, let me begin by starting about a year ago. Um, back in 2019, during the time of the last UK general election, my wife and I, my partner and I, decided to give an unusual birthday present to our children, to our 11-year-old twins. We decided to give them our votes, our votes in the election. So we sat around the kitchen table and we discussed all the different party policies and party manifestos. And then our children told us where to put the, the X on the ballot sheet, how to vote. And in case you're wondering, they didn't exactly vote how we would have voted. But the reason we did that, you might be wondering, why would you give your children your vote? Well, the reason we did it is because we live in an age of um, destructive short-termism. And I think we all know this, that our politicians can hardly see beyond the next election or even the latest tweet or newspaper headline. Um, companies can't see past the next quarterly report or the share price. Nations sit around international conference tables arguing away about their near-term interests while the planet burns and species disappear. And of course, as individuals, we're clicking the buy now button and always looking at our phones. So this is an age of the tyranny of the now, domination by short-term thinking. And I think we all know that we need more long-term thinking to deal with the great challenges of our society. The challenge of thinking, planning for the next pandemic, which is coming, or planning for the impacts of artificial intelligence or other technologies, such as lethal autonomous weapons, or maybe a genetically engineered pandemic, which is coming our way. We need long-term thinking to deal with inequalities, racial inequality and wealth inequality, which gets passed on from generation to generation. And of course, we need more long-term thinking to deal with the global ecological crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, to get us off our short-term addiction to a fossil fuel economy, which is destroying the lives of future generations and our planet. And in a way, there's a, a kind of paradox here because the need for long-term thinking is incredibly urgent. We need it right here and right now. Uh, and the way I think about this problem uh, is that I believe that humankind has colonized the future, that we see the future like a distant colonial outpost where we can dump ecological damage and technological risk as if there was nobody there. And it's a little bit like the way when Britain colonized Australia in the 18th and 19th century, they drew on or used a legal doctrine known as terra nullius, which is the Latin for nobody's land. They treated Australia like there were no indigenous people there. Of course, there were indigenous Australians there. And I think today, as, long, uh, as well as terra nullius, we now have something new, which is tempus nullius, the, the Latin for nobody's time. We treat the future like there is nobody there. Uh, it's an uninhabited territory. And the tragedy is that tomorrow's generations, most of them are not here. They can't do anything about it. They can't you know, block an Alabama bridge like a civil rights protester or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi or chain themselves to a parliament building like the Extinction Rebellion activists are doing today. You know? um, and the great tragedy here, I think, is that future generations have no political rights or representation. They have no influence in the marketplace. They are written out of history and society. And someone who really thought about this problem, which is a deep problem of intergenerational injustice, someone who thought about this was the immunologist Jonas Salk. He was the guy who in 1955 
discovered with his team that first polio vaccine. It saved millions of people's lives. And in later life, Jonas Salk said that the great question facing our century is this, are we being good ancestors? In other words, are we going to be remembered well by the generations of the future who look back on us? And he believed that if we were going to be good ancestors and be remembered well by all the future generations to come, we would need to um, extend our time horizons. So instead of thinking on a scale of seconds and minutes and hours, we needed to think and plan on a scale of decades and centuries and millennia. Um, and in many ways, there are some really inspiring projects around the world that you may have heard of, which extend our time horizons in this way. So for example, you may have heard of something called the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is a project in the Arctic Circle where they're keeping millions of seeds to protect the Earth's plant biodiversity, genetic biodiversity. So they've got millions of seeds from more than 6,000 species in an indestructible rock bunker that's designed to last for a thousand years, very long term. But even longer term than that is a project called the 10,000 year clock, which is a clock being built as we speak now in a mountain in the Texas desert in the United States. And it's being a project, this is a project of something called the Long Now Foundation, which I'm a research fellow of. They're based in the US. Their idea is to extend our sense of now from seconds to centuries and, and millennia. And the clock of the Long Now is a clock which is being built. You'll be able to visit it. It's been designed to last and stay accurate for 10,000 years. And to get there, you'll be able to hike through the desert for one or two days with your rucksack on, and you'll be able to visit the clock and walk up steps cut into the mountainside. And each of the steps is, is the value of a million years of geological time. And this project is like a, an art project or a culture project to extend our sense of time forward. So we take responsibility for people and planet many generations into the future. Now, as I've been speaking, you might have been thinking about some long-term projects that you know about. And what I'd love you to do for me now, in the, right now, is in the chat box. If you can think of any long-term projects that you know about or that inspire you, can you please write them down? Maybe it's a science project or a music project or something uh, that from Japanese culture, which is very long-term. See, I'd love to see what you're thinking about because there's lots of different examples. Uh, if you could, yeah, just write something in the chat box, that would be great. There's lots of different examples uh, of different types. You may have heard about the the building of medieval cathedrals, which take hundreds of years to build, or plantation forestry projects where, um, you know, trees are planted looking a century ahead. Somebody's mentioned the Rosetta Project, which is from a uh, project, the, the Long Now um, Foundation. Um, there's planting more corals, so that's in relation to, um, you know, the destruction of coral reefs. Um, re ocean plastic pro uh, uh, projects you can see there and those are long-term projects about reinvigorating the oceans. Um, the con conservation of historical artifacts and buildings, that's a really good example of long-term thinking, the idea of maintenance. How do we maintain things? I'm part of a project called uh, where we visit this uh, something called the White Horse, which is a, an art work that's been carved into a mountainside in England that's been there for 3,000 years and every year we go back and we knock chalk and, and we take the weeds out of this 100 foot wide horse. Uh, the building of the Sagrada Familia, which is a, the basilica, um, too, being built today, um, traveling to the moon. So fantastic examples you've got there. So you all know a lot about long-term thinking. I can see it uh, already. But there's a real question of, well, how do we get better at long-term thinking? And that's what I'd like to talk about now because um, oh, more great examples there of, of a atom bomb survivors talking to younger generations. So hopefully we can come back to some of these examples in the chat afterwards. But I think a real starting point for us getting better as individuals and a society is to think about our long-term brains, okay? 
about the neuroscience of long-term thinking. This is very important, I think, because we all know that in our minds, we are caught in a constant battle between short-term thinking and long-term thinking. Do I party today or save for my pension for tomorrow? Do I upgrade to the latest iPhone or do I plant a seed of the ground for future generations? And these two parts of our brains, I have names for them. There's a part of our brain which is all about the short term, about instant gratification, immediate rewards. I call this the marshmallow brain. You can see a little pink marshmallow. And it's called the marshmallow brain. It's named after a famous psychology experiment from the 1960s where a marshmallow was put in front of children. And if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were given a reward of a second marshmallow, two marshmallows. But the majority of children took the marshmallow and ate it, right? They couldn't resist. That's the short-term brain. It's an old part of the brain, 80 million years old. But we have another part of the brain. We have the short-term brain. We also have what I call the acorn brain. See if you can see that there, uh, like the acorn from an oak tree. This is the part of our brain which is about long-term thinking and planning and strategy. It's a new part of the brain. It's only about 2 million years old. There's a constant battle between these parts, but this part is very important. It's, it lives here in something called the frontal lobe, particularly a part called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It's wired into our brains and it's more developed. The acorn brain is more developed in humans than most other animals. So a chimpanzee, for example, does plan ahead. So they will take a stick from a tree, take off the leaves and turn it into a tool to poke into a termite hole, into an ant hole. But a chimpanzee will never make 12 of these tools and put them aside for next week. But that is exactly what humans do, right? We are planning all the time. We plan for our children's educations. We write song lists for our own funerals. It's long-term brain, the acorn brain, which has allowed us to build the Great Wall of China or to go into space, as somebody mentioned there, you know, traveling to the moon in the, in the chat box. So we need to learn how to really switch on, turn on this acorn brain and not just be dominated by the marshmallow brain. The question is, how do we do this, right? How do we do that? And that's what my book is largely about and explores different ways of turning on our long-term acorn brains. I just want to share an image with you now, um, which you should be able to uh, see there, which is a kind of a conceptual framework, an intellectual framework for thinking about long-term thinking. On the left-hand side there, you can see six different drivers of short-termism, the things, the, the deep factors which make us, our culture short-termist. Um, so you've got obvious ones, you know, digital distraction, you know, always looking at our phones speculative capitalism, the, the, the financial markets going up and down, driven by, you know, millisecond speed, nanosecond speed share trading. You've got other deeper factors like the top one, the tyranny of the clock. I mean, clocks have sped up time and brought the future closer ever since the invention of mechanical clocks in the 14th and 15th century. By the 18th century, most clocks had minute hands. By the 19th century, they had second hands. In Japan, in the late 19th century, everyone started wearing pocket watches, right? It was this huge thing, particularly amongst middle and upper, upper class Japanese. Everyone started looking at the time. Time was speeding up. These are factors which make us shorter term thinkers, always looking at the clock. There are many of them. But what I want to focus on today is looking at the six different ways to think long term, which you can see down the right hand side. Um, that's what I really want to talk about. And the first one I want to talk about is the idea of deep time humility. And the idea of deep time is the idea which you probably know of recognizing that the human species has only been here for a small portion of the history of the earth and the history of the universe. We are just been here for an eye blink of cosmic time. And in Western culture, the idea of deep time is new. It's only been around for about 200 years. Before that, the common Christian idea was that the earth was only 6,000 years old because that's what the Bible said. The Christian Bible said the earth is 6,000 years old. It was begun then in 4004 BC, if you trace back the dates. 
that in the late 18th and early evolutionary thinkers like Charles Darwin said, that is crazy. But we couldn't have evolved we were unless the earth was millions, maybe billions of years old. And we now know this, of course. Of billions of years of the age of the earth, the 3.8 billion years of life on earth. One way to think about it, there's a beautiful metaphor from the writer John McPhee. I mean, the age of the earth as the distance from outstretched hand. He said, one stroke of a nail file, like this, as my nail file, in human history. So human history is just one tiny part of this huge time. But we need to remember that deep time doesn't just go into the past, it also goes into the future. The history of our planet will go on at least five or six billion years maybe until our sun dies. And whatever creatures um, be around in five or six billion years will be as different from us as we are from the first era. We are just a And I think this is really important for long-term thinking, even about climate change and other issues, because it makes us recognize or ask a question, who are we to destroy the great chain of life with our deadly technologies and with our ecological blindness? You know, we are just a small part of the great chain of life. Um, and we have responsibility to kind of keep it going. And it's hard to practice deep time. Some people don't feel it strongly. Last week, I was with my children on a beach in England on the South Coast. Uh, in a place called Lyme Regis, and we were looking for fossils, and we were holding in our hands uh, a full of a, a, a creature that was 195 million years old, like a squid, like a kind of octopus thing. Um, and it's amazing, you hold it, you feel the eons of time stretching out. It's amazing, you can do it by visiting an ancient tree. You know, you can, there's probably a tree near where you live which might be a thousand years old. I think it's really important to feel that kind of deep time. But that's just the beginning of being a long-term thinker. My second way to think long-term is the idea of cathedral thinking. And cathedral thinking is the idea of embarking or starting projects with very long time horizons, maybe decades or even centuries, which even go beyond your own lifetime. And it's called cathedral thinking, named after in the European churches or cathedrals, a bit like the Sagrada Familia that was mentioned in the chat, which were people began building them and they, were, they weren't finished for many, many centuries. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Greta Thunberg has said we need cathedral thinking to deal with climate crisis, very long term vision. But cathedral thinking comes in very different forms. And let me just share my, uh, my screen with you again. So over the last 5,000 years, you can see in the top left hand corner there, this is a classic example of thinking a build, a religious building. This is a church in Germany called Alm Minster, gun in the year 1377, but it wasn't finished until 1890. So it took more than 500 years to build, right? That's a long-term project. On the right-hand side, you can see the sewers uh, of Victorian London built in the 19th century. In 1858, there was a a famous event in London called the Great Stink, where basically sewage shit from, the, from people's toilets was going into the, um, the Thames River. Uh, and the smell was so bad, it was killing people with diseases like cholera. The smell was so bad in 1858 um, that um, the government passed emergency legislation to build the tunnels under London to take the sewage out. And these tunnels were built twice as big as they needed to be. And those tunnels are still used today. It was a long-term project, amazing long-term vision. That's what we need today. In the bottom left-hand corner, you see another example of cathedral thinking, which is, these are the suffragettes, who was a, a women's movement in the late night in eight, 19th century Britain, who began campaigning for votes for women. But it took them more than 50 years to achieve their ambitions. And very, very long-term thinking. It comes in many forms. The next image is actually a Japanese one, which might be familiar to many people looking at this. This is another form of long-term thinking, just another practical example of the way humans 
are actually quite good at long-term thinking, even though we're always looking at our phones. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, Fukushima um, nuclear meltdown from tw uh, 2011, from the great tsunami. Um, so that is familiar. We know that, that the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant was destroyed with terrible uh, effects. On the left-hand side, you might know this. This is the Onagawa nuclear plant, which was quite close, Onagawa. It was even closer. It was hit by the tsunami even more, but it survived, okay? Now, why did it survive? It's a really interesting story you might know about. The reason that one on the left survived, have a nuclear meltdown, was because the, chi the engineer in the 1970s who was behind the planning for Onogawa nuclear plant, he decided to build the plant very high. He put a wall which was 15 meters high, and then he, he put the plant 15 meters high as well. So basically it was about 30 meters high and much higher than Fukushima. It was much higher than the regulations said. Why did he do this? Because it's really interesting because as a child, a shrine uh, about seven or eight kilometers in, inland in Japan, and there was a, 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 a memorial plaque saying that this had been destroyed in the ninth century, in the ninth century by a tsunami. So he knew the tsunamis could destroy. And in order to make the, the Onogawa plant resilient, the chief engineer uh, put the plant very high. And this is really important for long-term planning, climate planning, having resilience into um, our systems. So those kinds of examples of cathedral thinking are everywhere. At the same time, cathedral thinking is not always good for us. It can be put towards very narrow and self-serving ends. So for example, in the Second World War in Germany, Adolf Hitler wanted to found a, an a thousand year Reich. He wanted to build something that would last a thousand years. That's cathedral thinking. Or in North Korea, the North Korean political regime wants to pass on power through their family from generation to generation. That's cathedral thinking too. Or um, in the corporate world, the investment bank Goldman Sachs, a former head of the investment bank Goldman Sachs, a guy called Gus Levy once said, we're, we are, um, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Um, and so there's many examples of this long-term thinking, but very, very narrow. In fact, in Japan, it just occurred to me, the, the founder of the bank SoftBank, uh, who is the guy, I can't remember his name. Can someone write in the chat the name of the guy who founded SoftBank, the tech company? Um, he says, we want our company to grow. Ah, right, Son uh, Masayoshi, yes. He said, I want the company to grow for 300 years or more. Well. Okay, fine, but is he really thinking about all the future generations and all of their welfare? Maybe, maybe not, right? So we need to think about deep time, we need to think about cathedral thinking, but let's think more. And that brings me on to my third point, which is the idea of intergenerational justice. And this is the idea of extending our time horizons, thinking about the future, but thinking about all of our future generations, not just your company, or not just your own country or your own town or your own community, something bigger than this. Now, it can be quite difficult to think about all those future generations that are coming. Um, so let me show you a photograph, a picture of these future generations, okay? Here they are. This is an image I call the scale of unborn generations. Sorry, my son is just trying to come into the room and I'm telling him to go away. <laughs> um, the, uh, so this, this is images, the scale of unborn generations. In the small green circle, you can see the living, people who are alive today, 7.7 .7 billion people on earth. In the gray circle is everyone who has lived and died over the past 50,000 years. There's 100 billion of them, the dead. But look at that big orange circle. Over the next 50,000 years, an estimated nearly 7 trillion people will be born, assuming that lies. You know, so that's a huge number of people. Look at that circle. Even in the next two centuries, tens of billions of people will be born. So there in that, few, that big orange circle are all your grandchildren and their grandchildren and the friends and communities on whom they'll depend. So how will they all look back on us? 
and the legacy we're leaving for them. How will they think about the decisions we made or we didn't make when we had the chance, when we knew so much about the climate crisis, but did nothing, you know, or did very little. So this is who we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about intergenerational justice. And I think a really good example of putting this kind of thinking, um, bringing it into the modern, the American idea of seventh generation thinking, the idea of thinking seven generations uh, ahead from now. And this is practiced today in North American, um, Native American communities. Here's a quote from Oren Lyons, a chief of the uh, Onondaga people, the, from the Iroquois people in, in Native America. And um, as he says there, we're looking ahead as, as one of the first mandates given to us as uh, chiefs to make sure that every decision we make relates to the welfare and well-being of the seventh generation to come. And that's the basis on which we make decisions in council. Will this be a benefit to the seventh generation? And I think that's how our politicians should be thinking, right? Seven. Thinking, okay, it's fine in Native American communities, but how do we bring this into practice in everyday life today and in politics where our politicians are just thinking literally about five minutes ahead or maybe a few months ahead? Well, there's a really... I'm inspired by many, many examples of trying to put this idea into practice, seventh generation thinking in intergenerational justice. Let me show you an example from Japan that you might know about. The movement called Future Time. Some of you may have heard of it. I think it's very important. It's really, really powerful and interesting. Um, and if you want to find out about future design, that you can see the website in the bottom of the, um, of the screen there. So future design is a form of local government decision making started in Japan um, a few years ago, and it's based on inspired by the Native American idea of seventh generation thinking. And the way it works is that local citizens, and some of you may know about this, are invited to a meeting to discuss plans for the towns and the cities where they live. And when they're invited, they're split into two groups. One half of the group are told that they are residents from the present day. From the other half are given these kind of almost ceremonial robes to wear, wearing some low ones. And they are told to imagine themselves as being residents from the year 2060, from 2060. And it turns out that the residents from 2060 advocate or they call for much more transformative and radical city plans, whether it's investment in medical care or education or climate change action. So by imagining themselves in 2060, they come up with much more progressive long-term planning. Design used in small towns like Yahaba and major cities like Kyoto. And if you go to the website, which I'm sorry, it's only in Japanese, but you can use Google Translate. And uh, you can see all the places, they're even doing it in the Japanese Ministry of Finance. You know, I really, if you don't know about future design, have a look at it because it's all about long-term thinking, but it's about grassroots decision-making. So I would love every country in the world to adopt this Japanese model of future design as part of their town planning and, and city planning. More long-term vision. Now there are other, generational justice into practice, which let me just mention one more or a couple more. In Wales, in Britain, um, there is a new political position called the Future Generations Commissioner. And that commission is a public position where the commissioner's job is to look at the impact of environmental policy or economic policy on 30 years in the future. And in the United States, there's a very important legal movement, um, an organization called Our Children's Trust which is inspired again by Native American seventh generation thinking. And their aim is to, um, to campaign. In fact, Our Children's Trust is campaigning on behalf of 21 young people. They filed a legal case against the US government campaigning for the right to a safe climate and healthy atmosphere for both current and future generations. Now, this is amazing because it's saying it's a change in the nature of human rights. It's saying we ought to give rights, not just to people who are alive today, but to people who are alive in the future. 
This movement is starting to influence legal cases around the world. Colombia, Uganda, um, the Netherlands, obviously in the US. These are long struggles, but really important ways of making intergenerational justice a reality. So that's my third kind of long-term thinking, intergenerational justice. The fourth kind I want to talk about is the idea of what I call a legacy mindset, which is about how we are going to be remembered by future generations. And the interesting thing about the idea of legacy is that most human beings, particularly when they reach middle age, uh, so maybe the age of sort of 35, 45, they start thinking about how they're going to be remembered when they're dead. You know, how do I keep my memory or the fire of my life still burning? Now, the thing about legacy is that, think about if you look back at the past, we have inherited amazing legacies from past generations, haven't we? I mean, we, we were given the gift of the agricultural revolution. We live in cities that were built centuries ago. Uh, we, are the, we benefit from medical discoveries made over the last 200 years. They keep us alive, you know, or our children alive. But we have also inherited very negative legacies too. We've inherited legacies of um, racism from colonialism and slavery era, which is passed on from generation to generation in public institutions. We've inherited a fossil fuel addicted economy uh, and an addiction to endless economic growth, which is destroying our planet and the lives of future generations. So we need to stop and think, well, what kind of, what kind of legacy should we be leaving? Um, now, some people want to leave a very egotistical form of legacy, like a Russian oligarch who wants to have a football stadium or a baseball stadium named after them. Some people want to leave a legacy for their families. Like, I care about my children. You know, I want to leave a, a house or, or wealth or pass on family tradition or religion or languages. But I think if we're going to be good ancestors, we need to think on a much bigger scale. We need to be thinking about leaving a legacy for the universal strangers of the future. What I call future holders, not shareholders, but future holders. All those future generations in the orange circle. But it's very hard to connect with them, isn't it? Like in our daily lives, how do we really feel a connection a century or two centuries from today? Especially when we live, most of us live in very individualistic uh, kind of consumer capitalist. Of course, cultures are different. Japanese culture is different to British culture, different to Brazilian culture. But in general, we're very trapped in the now. We're not like those native, most of us aren't like Native Americans thinking seven generations ahead. So how can we make this leap? Well, I'd like to uh, offer you a little thought experiment. I'd like you to do this with me. What I'd like you to do, it's, it's a little uh, exercise I call the Great Chain of Life. And it's inspired by Native American thinking and Maori thinking. Um, what I'd like you to do is just for a moment, I'd like you to close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine in your mind a child who you really care about. It could be your little brother or sister or a nephew or a niece or a neighbor's child. Think of a little child that you know. Picture their face, look at their face. Now I'd like you to imagine that tiny child 30 years into the future. So with your eyes still closed, imagine 30 years from now. And again, picture their face. Imagine what the things that they love about life and what are the struggles that they're facing, their joys and their suffering. Think about them 30 years from now. And now I want you to imagine them on their, imagine them on their 90th birthday. They're now 90 years old. They're surrounded by family and friends and their work colleagues. Have a look out the window. What's happening in the window outside in their world? And now go back and look at their face, their 90-year-old face. And suddenly somebody comes over and puts a tiny baby into their arms. And this is their first great-grandchild. And they look down at this tiny baby and they look into its eyes and try to imagine what would this child need to survive and thrive for the years and the decades ahead. Just think of that for a moment. Now I'd like you to open your eyes again and thank you for doing that. 
that little imaginative exercise, it can be quite difficult, especially if you're like me, you have quite a dark vision of the future. And I'm thinking of what's happening in the world outside that window for my 90 year old daughter, you know, but I know it can be confronting, but that kind of exercise I think can help us connect with future generations. If you think of the little baby in the 90 year old's arms, that little baby could be alive in the 22nd century. So the 22nd century is not just from a science fiction film. This is a real life. It's only one or two steps away from your own life. You know? And I think if we care about that little baby, we need to care not just about that baby's life, we need to care about all life because that baby is surrounded by a web of relationships, of community, of family, friends, a web of, of the, the natural world, the air it will breathe and, and the, the food that it will eat. So I think we need to do these thought experiments to open our minds, connect us. And there's some really wonderful art projects and other projects which connect us with those future generations. One of them I love is called the Fu um, Future Library. And if Future Library, if you go to Future Library, can't remember the website, but you'll find it. Um, it's a project from the Scottish artist called Katie Patterson. And it's a 100 year art project. Every year for the next 100 years, a famous writer is donating a book which will remain locked and kept inside the future library. And in the year 2114, the 100 books will be printed on paper made from a forest of trees which has been planted in uh, outside Oslo in Norway. And those trees are growing now. So the first person to give a book was the Canadian writer Margaret Atwood, the Turkish writer Elif Shafak, and others have given books. Um, and Margaret Atwood will never see this book published while she's alive. She will never meet the readers. It's an amazing gift to future generations. And I think it's an inspiration for thinking long term. We can all ask ourselves, what gifts might we all leave for those generations of the future? Um, let me now just shift to the last two kinds of long term thinking. The, the, the fifth one I want to talk about is the idea of holistic forecasting, the idea of predicting the future. Now, of course, the, predict, the future is difficult to predict. We don't know what it's going to be like, of course. Um, and, but I think it's still important to think about predicting the future, because if we don't think and do any predictions, then we're not going to make any plans. We're only going to react in the present moment. And of course, we need to be looking at the future, what it might hold. Um, but, you know, the common way of predicting the future, so if you work in a corporation, in a company, and they're doing forecasting uh, or foresight work, they're looking sometimes three years ahead, maybe 10 years ahead. Most governments don't look more than 10, maybe 20, 30 years ahead. Even the NASA space program is only about 30 years ahead. The Chinese government's national plans are only 35 years ahead. Um, I think we need to start looking further. Climate scientists, of course, are now starting to look 100, maybe 200 years ahead at sea level rises. But when I'm talking about holistic forecasting, I'm thinking about looking thousand years ahead at the, the future, not just of a company or a country, but of the whole of human civilization. What will our future be? I think we need to think about this incredibly big and difficult question. Well, I think a starting point for thinking about that big question is to look into the past. Here's uh, an amazing diagram created um, based on data from a Cambridge University researcher called Luke Kemp. And what it does is it, what he did is he studied the length of different civilizations, ancient civilizations. He looked at about 90 of them. So the Roman Empire and Chinese, the Ming Dynasty or um, the Akkadian uh, Empire in, in um, in the Middle East. And what he discovered was that the average age of a civ was 300 years, right? It's quite a short time, right? Uh, and what he, his point was that no matter how sophisticated, how militarily strong, how wealthy and advanced a civilization, all civilizations are born, they rise, and then they die, okay? That is the reality that we're facing. And if past civilizations like the Roman Empire declined, well, so will our global capitalist civilization. It may not last forever. And so I think this is what holistic forecasting is about. It's about thinking about the, sh the shape of our society. Will it 
just keep growing and growing and growing and growing or or will it decline no it's going to decline and the question we must face now is well how do we stop it declining or how do we keep it going for as long as possible or how do we create a new kind of civilization that can survive longer into the the deep future and that really takes me to my final and sixth important point which is about the idea of a transcendent goal okay and the idea of a transcendent goal is about having an ambition or a goal which is transcendent or universal um, which is bigger than yourself and i believe that our species homo sapiens need to have a goal as a species we need to have an ambition if we are going to survive for the long term both people and planet now the problem i think is what we're facing is if you think about well what is the goal at the moment do we have a goal as a society well in a way i think we do have a goal um and let me show you well in fact there's several different goals on offer the left on the left side in the image there you can see what i call perpetual progress or continual progress this is pursuing material improvement and endless economic growth this is basically the goal that we currently pursue most governments particularly since the second world war have given their ambition to be economic growth economic growth more and more and more growth but we know now that pursuing perpetual economic growth as you've probably heard from some of the lectures you've heard over the last few days cannot go on into the long term because we've pushed beyond safe planetary boundaries we've gone over safe limits of carbon dioxide emissions biodiversity loss um soil degradation chemical pollution all of these things and i think the people who believe in the idea of perpetual progress like the uh, psychologist steven pinker in his book uh, enlightenment now you know he's a bit like my children when they were very small they used to think you could blow up a balloon keep blowing it up and and it would never it would never burst it would never pop but even a 3 year old knows that you can't keep blowing up the balloon without it bursting and i think that's what we're doing now with our civilization trying to keep growing thinking technology will solve all our problems but we we've, we've pushed earth over a dangerous level is the great acceleration of rising you know um ecological crisis indicators like as i said co2 and so on so i think as a goal for humanity perpetual progress is not a good idea the second one is what called techno liberation technological liberation like for example the idea of colonizing other worlds this is what elon musk wants right let's go to mars that's all of our problems we'll, we'll we'll escape earth now the problem with that well one problem is that mars is a very far long way away 30 million miles very cold there's no on mars as nice to live as the top of mount everest or the bottom of antarctica it's not clear that we'll ever be able to terraform or change the atmosphere so that humans could live on it. we probably won't send the first person us until about 2040 i think an astronaut not long ago who said don't think we're going to mars anytime soon and but i think the big problem with that idea that we can solve our problems by going to other other worlds because on on some level this is how we could survive as a species if we're on many many planets then we could destroy this one and we would survive but the problem with saying oh let's go to mars is that it makes us think we don't need to look after this planet yet we know this is the only planet we know that can sustain life right um it is incredibly risky to i think focus say the um, our ambition to be colonize other worlds when we haven't yet learned to live within the limits of this world and that's why i believe that the the great transcendent goal for humanity should be what i call one planet thriving which is meeting the needs of all current and future people within the means of our planet okay and this idea is the fundamental idea of of the field of ecological economics when i studied economics 30 years ago i never i'd never even heard of ecological economics but it's a whole field of economics and i really uh, urge you to, to to look into it which is about living within and creating an economy that stays within the planetary limits so not using more resources that can naturally be regenerated so you don't chop down more trees that can grow back each year year and you don't create more waste than the planet can absorb it sounds obvious right but that's not what you're normally taught if you're doing a course in economics 
Now, someone who I think was really good at thinking about this idea of living within planetary boundaries is um, the uh, designer, what's called a biomimicry designer, Janine Benyas. Janine is her name. And let me just read out this very important quote from her. She says, the answers we seek, the secrets to a sustainable world are literally all around us. If we cho truly choose to mimic life's genius, the future I see will be beauty and abundance and certainly fewer regrets. In the natural world, the definition of success is the continuity of life. Um, you keep yourself alive and you keep your offspring alive. That's success. But it's not the offspring in this generation. Um, it's keeping you know, it alive for 10,000 generations or more. But that presents a conundrum or a difficulty because you're not going to be there to take care of your offspring 10,000 generations or more. So what organisms have learned to do is to take care of the place that's going to take care of their offspring. Life has learned to create conditions conducive to life. That's really the magic part of it. It's also the design brief right now. You have to learn how to do that. In other words, over 3.8 billion years of evolution, the way that a bird or a beaver or a bear keeps alive as a species is by living within the ecosystem in which it's embedded, by not fouling the nest, by taking care of the ecological place that will take care of their children and grandchildren and so on. And that's what humans are so bad at. We are destroying our nest, like a bird's nest. Um, we use on average 1.6 planet Earths each year in terms of resources. And why I think this quote is so brilliant is that what it tells you is that to be a long-term thinker is to not just think about lengthening time, but about regenerating place. We must restore and repair and care for the pre-home that will take care of our offspring. You know, for, so for our children and for our children's children, we need to fall in love with rivers and with mountains, with ice sheets and savannas, and reconnect with the long and life-giving cycles of nature. I believe that we should all become kind of time rebels, thinking long-term by embracing a, a, a Mohawk, a Native American uh, saying or blessing. When a child is born, they say, thank you, Earth. You know the way. I believe that is how we create a long-term future, thinking about place as much of time. But in order to take this kind of idea and make it a reality in politics and our economies, we need, I think, a model, a conceptual model. And let me just offer this to you before I finish. This is a model called the donut economy or donut economics. Some of you may have heard of this. It's created by the ecological economist, Kate Rayworth. Um, it's officially called the Donut of Social and Planetary Boundaries. It's based on her book called Donut Economics. I recommend you read it. So the, let me explain the donut. The green circle in the middle that says social foundation is an inner ring. And the idea is that if we're going to survive and thrive for the long term, we need to bring people above a basic social foundation in terms of water, food, health care, all these things you see in the middle circle. And these are based on the, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs from the UN. The outer circle is the ecological ceiling. These are planetary boundaries I've talked about, like ozone depletion, climate change, and so on. So in order to have a, a long-term future for people and planet, we need to bring people above the social foundation, but without pushing beyond the ecological ceiling. So we have to be inside the light green area, what she calls the safe and just space for humanity. In other words, instead of having the goal of your economy being to grow, grow, grow 2% a year, 3% a year, the goal should be to get into the donut above the social foundation, but within the ecological ceiling. And you can see the red parts of the diagram is a, 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 like a selfie of today's global civilization. We are not bringing people as a global civilization we haven't brought people above the social foundation. So the longer one of those little red segments is, the more, for example, people don't have water or they don't have health care. And you can see the outside, we've gone beyond the boundaries on climate change, biodiversity loss, land conversion, nitrous, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, and probably on some of the other ones too now. So this is a devastating and terrible picture of humanity. 
This is how we are failing to meet a transcendent goal of living within the means of the planet. Um, so let me just really finish up now. I've talked about these six different ways to think long term. Um, I think all of them are important in different ways. These are like a mental toolkit for being a long term thinker. Um, they're difficult, they're challenging, we're caught in the short term world. But let's remember where we are now at this moment of history. This is a moment of crisis because the climate crisis, but also the COVID-19 crisis. You know, the economist Milton Friedman, who I don't quote very often, once said, only a crisis, real or perceived, can create genuine change. And we need to remember that. If you think about the Second World War, out of the Second World War came amazing long-term thinking. Um, the World Health Organization, the European Union, where I live in Britain, the National Health Service, in Japan, the whole um, reconstruction of Japan after the Second World War and economic planning and all that kind of stuff, long-term vision. We are at another moment in history where we need similar long-term vision to tackle particularly the ecological crisis. This is the moment to do this. I think we have the potential, as I've shown you in all the historical examples, we can become long-term thinkers. We can become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. You are amongst those ancestors and I'm now going to stop talking and I hope now we're going to have time um, for some questions. So I think now I'm handing back over to Maddie, who's going to get questions. Please write your questions in the chat box and let us have a bit of a conversation. Thank you so much for that, Roman. It has been beyond fascinating. And you've spoken to so many of the concerns that we've already voiced during the conference, like temporality, the conflict between uh, political goals and scientific truths. Uh, um, and, and a lot of uh, I want to zoom out um, and actually talk a bit about your own intellectual trajectory. So a lot of your previous work focuses on empathy. Um, and um, in your book, you explain how you realize you came to the conclusion that empathy, um, it doesn't have to be just geographical, walking in somebody else's shoes. And then there's an empathy museum uh, that's been sent to the chat now. Um, it's also temporal empathy. Um, so can you, can you talk a, a bit more about that idea and yes. how you came so to this? For many years, I've been interested in the topic of empathy. Um, in fact, I've even written a book about it. There it is. Uh, uh, empathy, why it matters and how to get it. And I think this one is available in Japanese. I think it's recently come out in Japanese, I think. Um, and um, the idea of empathy is the idea, or what's technically called cognitive empathy, is the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Imagine the world from their perspective, from a different culture or gender, whatever it happens to be. And I've always believed that this is very fundamental for social uh, transformation, that we need to step into the shoes of people who are powerless, who are ignored, who are voiceless. And as um, you saw there in the chat box, as a museum link, I founded a museum called the Empathy Museum. And one of our exhibitions is called A Mile in My Shoes. Um, and it's a gigantic shoe box, an actual shoe box, which travels around the world. It hasn't been in Japan, actually, but it's been in the United States and Ireland and in Brazil. And you walk inside the shoe box and it's the world's first empathy shoe shop. So you go inside the shoe box and somebody belonging to a stranger and you put them on. So and they might be the shoes of someone who's been in prison for 15 years or the shoes of a Syrian refugee. And you can actually walk in their shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their life. So you put on headphones and you hear their story in their own words. It's amazing. We have hundreds and hundreds of shoes, pairs of shoes and stories. And you can see them on the website there and you can listen to some of them. Uh, there's two. But one of the of the Empathy Museum is you're stepping into the shoes of people in today's world, right? People who are alive today. And one of the issues it raises for me is, well, how do we step into the shoes of those future people, the future generations? And that's, in a way, why I wrote this book, The Good Ancestor, because thinking about how do we actually make that leap? Because we can't talk to those future generations. We can't step into their shoes. And I don't know, it, there's probably a Japanese expression for stepping into someone else's shoes. Maybe like, I don't know if it's the same expression or stepping inside somebody's skin. Um, some cultures have that. <clears throat> but, um, and that's the challenge of this. And I, you know, there are different ways of making this leap. 
You know, partly we did it just now by closing your eyes and imagining someone who's 90, you know, a child who's 90 and thinking of their great grandchild. There are more, I guess, other more philosophical ways of doing it as well. If any of you are studying philosophy, you may have come across the philosopher John Rawls, who in the 1970s wrote a book called A Theory of Justice. And he had this idea of what was called the veil of ignorance. Imagining you had like a blindfold on, you couldn't see. Imagine you didn't know what, where you were going to be born. Would you be born as a, as a poor beggar in India or as a, a rich uh, tech, uh, tech executive in Silicon Valley? If you didn't know where you were going to be born, what, what, what class or what gender, what country, he said, you know, try to imagine what kind of world would you design? And, you know, he basically argued you wouldn't, design a world that was very unequal with just a few rich and a lot of poor because you might be randomly be become one of these poor people okay but if you think about that veil of ignorance experiment that blindfold imagine also you're not just thinking that you don't know where you will be born today but you don't know what generation you will be born into imagine that as well imagine you might be born today you might be born a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now okay then what kind of world would you design you know and that is a philosophical way of making an empathic leap, of trying to make that connection. It's very challenging, but I think there's lots of tools for doing it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Brennan, you've made a very interesting comment um, in the chat. Would you like to speak up or, or should I read it out? Uh, I don't mind. I'll go speak up about it. Uh, yeah, um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was great um, as a philosophy student. Um, but what struck me was the fact that of your optimism and that, the fact that you want you were hopeful for a new future which was quite fascinating because i've spoken to people in my peers who are from lower ends of the, of the social hierarchy who have families who work in factories or aren't as well off as me and often when i speak to them about the future they look more about they care more about securing social stability and um, securing economic stability such as food housing and rent so because of that, do you think those people who are struggling right now still owe the future? Um, they still owe the future their input into creating a better society or better generation, even though those people are the same ones who are struggling right now? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And it goes to the heart of a fundamental philosophical and real world policy dilemma, which is, what is the balance between the, the rights and interests of current generations and future generations? And also, what are the practical impacts of, of course, people are struggling now with their challenges? Should they even be thinking about the future? So like my father, for example, was a refugee from Poland to Australia. I'm Australian. From Poland to Australia after the Second World War. He was just trying to deal with, when he arrived in Australia, with his immediate issues, food, housing, racism, everything like that. You know, like today, there are 220 million refugees and migrants around the world. By 2050, there'll be 450 million. So who are we to ask all those people necessarily to think long-term, uh, think about future generations? So let me say a couple of things about that. Of course, I understand that. In some way, you mentioned people are worried about their security. The reason people want security, like if you're a refugee, is because you want to be able to plan. You can't plan for your children's education if you don't have any basic security today. You don't have somewhere to live. You don't have a secure job. So of course, they're thinking long term, but they're not necessarily thinking 100, 200 years from now. But here's something that's really, I find really, really interesting. When you look at long term thinking around the world, what you find in general, I found, is it's often it's the wealthiest people have this, a very narrow sense of long-term thinking, right? So for example, an aristocrat in Britain might be thinking, okay, long-term, but I want to pass on my gigantic house just to my children or their children, keep it all in the family bloodline. But think about something like that Native American idea of seventh generation thinking. There are communities who are definitely not socioeconomically well off. They are insecure in many ways, but they are thinking many, many generations ahead because they, they have a, a very strong cultural sense of ecological stewardship and identity. So they, they're wanting to pass on a world fit for their children, even though they're facing difficulties to, today. They're also thinking long-term. 
Or for example, the Black Lives Matters movement is very interesting in this way too. You've got, if you pick up a book, a really good book I recommend, um, I find interesting called Me and White Supremacy by Leila Saad. She says, look, this is for me all about being a good ancestor because what she's saying is racism and colonialism, slavery are designed into our criminal justice systems and other public institutions. If we don't deal with them, these inequalities and, uh, will just be passed on from generation to generation. So there's a, what's really interesting to me is that if you look around the world at the different parts of the intergenerational justice movement, and I really think there is a growing movement, um, doesn't really have a name yet. You know, I think of these, all these different organizations I've talked about as time rebels, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a time rebellion going on, whether it's the future design movement in Japan or Black Lives Matters, people thinking about time. Um, and I think there's, they come from many, many different perspectives. But I do rec recognize, Pranavan, that they're, they're, of course, people are dealing with ev everyday problems now and they need to deal with those problems now. But it's just very interesting to see that there's actually across socioeconomic groups and different cultures, there's actually much more long-term thinking that you might, than you might imagine. But thanks for that brilliant Thank question. Thank you. Aidan? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. And I'm definitely really interested to check out the book now that having heard you speak about it. But my sort of question to you is um, perhaps on a kind of personal kind of beliefs level, but what do you think that, that we can do now to try and get the next generation of political leaders to engage with this long term thinking? Yeah. OK, that's a really important question, too, because there's a there's a real practical issue here. How do we how do we just turn this into reality? I've written a book. So what? On some level, OK, books are just books. Right? Um, and I've always been interested in how do you translate ideas into reality? Like, you know, a book on empathy I found at a museum got involved in politics and so on. But what practically can we do and should we do? I think. If I'm really, really honest, I think these issues, particularly the climate crisis, are so urgent that individual action is definitely not enough. We must act collectively. We must act as a group. And there, but I think we all need to find different ways of doing that depending on who we are. So for some of us, I think supporting those legal actions like the Our Children's Trust one I mentioned is a really good idea. It depends on your country. I don't know enough about Japanese law um, but you might think about starting a movement to give constitutional rights to future generations. You might contact the organization, Our Children's Trust in the US. They want to be contacted. They've been contacted by Korean students saying, we want to start a, la a legal case in Korea, South Korea, for future generations rights. And they're getting help with that. You might decide, decide to contact that future design movement um, and, um, and, and, and get involved in doing it in your university or your college for planning or your local community. So I think there's all those sort of things we can be doing. You, you'll be involved maybe in Extinction Rebellion or other movements. So I think we all find our own ways depending on who we are, whether we're an introvert or an extrovert or whatever. But I do believe in now is the time for collective action. I believe that's mostly how history changes. I think as individuals, you can do things, but you need to do things ideally which can be amplified. So for example, very small example, I have solar panels on my roof. But one of the reasons my wife and I got solar panels is not just for us, for our house, because we know that when you get solar panels, your neighbors get solar panels and then their, their neighbors get solar panels. It spreads. It can be amplified. Um, and then I think there are the more everyday things we can do because as individuals, we do need to change who we are as people. That's why I take my children to the beach and look for fossils or visit an ancient tree. Like new cultural habits we can develop. In fact, yesterday on Twitter, I was in, in touch with um, a writer, a, a, a Scottish writer, English writer called um, David Farrier, who's written a really good, I've got it here. Um, I'm just looking for it. I can't find it. It's called Future Fossils by David Farrier. Anyway, he was saying yesterday, he wants to have an create an annual future generations day around the world where we celebrate future generations and we do actions and things. And 
that could happen all around the world. So I think there's lots of um, practical stuff we could be doing uh, along those lines. And then, you know, me uh, as an individual, I'm a few weeks ago, I had to do a briefing for British members of parliament about my book and the ideas. And that's another kind of challenge of what do we do to and again, I spoke to them about something called discount rates, which any of you who are studying economics will have studied discount rates. And I was telling them to change the, the way governments discount the future, way they make calculations about long-term investment decisions. But that's another quite complex area. But I think there's basically, I think there's a hell of a lot we can be doing. Um, I think what's really fundamental though, is to, to develop a sense that there is a global movement around these issues, to connect everybody up who may not have the word good ancestor on their website or time rebel in their mission statement. But in fact, if you can bring them all into the room and say, look, we're all doing the same thing here, right? You know, um, we might look different in our ambitions, but we're actually part of a global movement for doing something very fundamental. The first time in history, creating a global movement for thinking long-term to deal with the climate crisis and other crises. Uh, just before we go to Nicole's question, I want to piggyback off um, of Aidan because it's quite related. And this is my uh, my own sort of interest. Uh, my dissertation was about Extinction Rebellion and the idea of democratic reform. And um, it was very interesting to me when you mentioned um, the citizens' assemblies in Japan. Um, and um, it seems like the traditions that you, you seem to invoke are, are quite discursive. So uh, they, they, they stand in quite stark contrast to voting, which is a very representative but shallow ways of, of expressing your opinion. So, so do you think that, uh, because in XR, uh, people are quite disillusioned with voting. They don't think it can, it can, it can do what he needs to be doing anymore, but we need to go deeper in, in terms of, of democratic involvement through discursive practices. Do, do you think that's true? Or is, is there still hope left for voting? Yeah. You know, I used to be a political scientist uh, many years ago. I'm not anymore, um, luckily. Um, and I used to really believe that you could change the world through changing political systems uh, and things like voting and law and so on. And then I became very disillusioned about that. Uh, and in many ways, I still am. I believe in the power of social movements. I believe in direct action, not only, but I, you know, so I think like Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Futures, all this stuff, this is how history changes. That's why Mahatma Gandhi went on a salt march. That's why civil rights protesters stage sit in and block things. You know, there's a, because of unjust laws, right? And there's a time for direct action and breaking the rules. And I think that time is definitely now. I mean, it's, it's clear to me. At the same time, while writing this book, I've developed more faith in some traditional political forms of action, which are not necessarily discursive. Um, so particularly the importance of legal change. I really believe in some countries, pursuing a legal route is very fundamental. It really depends on where you are. So for example, as I said, in the United States, campaigning for the rights, constitutional rights of future people is important. That's not going to work in the UK where there's no written constitution. But, you know, in New Zealand, They've gone down a different route, which is trying to secure legal personhood, legal rights for nature, for rivers and mountains. So a very famous legal case in, in New Zealand is that a river called the Wanganui River, which is sacred to local Maori people, has been given legal rights, like a corporation gets rights. You know, In India, the Ganges River and the Yamuna Rivers have the rights of a human being to try and protect them. It's not an answer because of course rights can be violated you know but it's a start now on the question of voting as i said in the beginning my my wife and i my partner and i gave our children our votes and the reason we did that was partly as i said because we believe it's a it's a kind of an act in defiance of short-termism and it's our children who are going to inherit the future um and the consequences of our decision. Somebody in the chat early on mentioned Brexit. As we know, in the UK, two thirds of under 25s voted against Brexit, right? And the majority of over 60s voted for 65s voted for it. A huge injustice there, I think, brought about by the nature of the electoral system. Um, and the re but the other reason my wife and I decided to give our children our vote was because in 2019, I don't know if you remember this, but an incredible movement started spreading across Europe 
that teenagers across Europe started giving their votes, I mean, started lobbying their parents and grandparents to give them their votes in the European parliamentary elections of 2019, right? And there was a hashtag, give the kids your vote, that spread everywhere. Um, it was started, I think, by uh, someone called Lily, Lily Plastic Cups. If you look her up on um, uh, Twitter, Lily Plastic Cups, her grandfather gave his vote to her. And that movement spread as far as Australia. And my partner and I heard about it, gave our kids a vote. So I think on the level of voting, in a, in a sense, it's a little bit more symbolic because, you know, even if you gave 12 year olds the vote, their votes could still be captured by corporations and advertising and you'd still have the same politicians who are short termists. That's why I also believe you need the citizens assemblies. You need the legal changes. And the third thing you need, well, you need the few things like future generations commissioners, like the one I mentioned. And the fourth thing you need is devolution. So you need to take power away from central government and go to the local level, particularly through deliberative democracy, through those sort of citizen assembly things, because amount of evidence showing that if you ask local citizens to think about the future, they have a much longer term vision than elected politicians. And my hope is that the old model of representative democracy, which has been around, it's new, it's only been around for 200 years. I hope it is dying. It is dying anyway, right? Because that's why there's been the rise of far right populism. The sense that traditional parties can't deliver on dealing with problems, whether it is job insecurity, economic insecurity, or migration, or climate. So we need, to, this is a moment, we're in a moment of reinventing democracy. And we're seeing that with the rise of these citizens' assemblies around the world. In Ireland, really important citizen assembly movement. Spain, Belgium, future design in Japan. I think that movement, I think of it as a citizen assembly movement, you know, and it's growing. And I, I really, I want to support it. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, overall, so to answer this long answer to your question, yes, to discursive participatory processes, but let not, let's not forget some of the other things like the law, legal things that can embed rights, long-term long -term struggles. Thank you so, so, so much. That's absolutely fascinating. And um, because Nicole has a problem with her mic, I'm gonna read out her question, which is, do you think it makes more sense to think of future generations as subjects of justice or as recipients of benevolence? Wow, that's a good question. Subjects of justice or recipients of benevolence. Wait, give me a minute to think about that. I've never thought about that. Um, okay, let me give you my spontaneous answer to that, <laughs> but I probably need to think about it more. Um, the idea of recipients of benevolence can sound a bit top down and condescending. Oh, we must help those poor future generations. Like, we must help those poor refugees. Well, that's not giving them much dignity. That's not really an idea based on justice. It's a, yeah, top-down paternalistic idea. So I would say, no, that doesn't sound a good way to think about future generations. On the other hand, oh wait, let, let me say that, I'll say that. And then I think as I've been talking, You've heard me use the language of justice um, to be a, somebody who holds rights, I think is really fundamental. This has been the, the gift of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the whole, in fact, regime of rights since the French Revolution. If you feel that you have rights, then you can fight for those rights. And they are universal. They're not just top down. They are granted to you by nature of being a person. And I think for the foundation of political movements, the idea of justice is a better way to think about it. The problem, of course, is those future generations aren't claiming those rights, okay? That's the philosophical, practical problem. They can't come and fight here. So we have to do the fighting for them, right? And so that brings us back to benevolence again, because we're kind of acting on their behalves. So there's a tension there between treating future generations as a subject of rights and as, or justice and as, recipi as recipients of benevolence. And I, but I think if we're gonna do the benevolence part, we've gotta do it in the right way. And that's why I talk not about 
benevolence, I talk about legacy and think about the idea of a transcendent or a, a universal legacy or a legacy mindset to try and that's not an idea based on justice. It's much more personal because we also need personal connection, right? My belief by looking at human history is that uh, rationality and emotion go together. That the struggle for rights, the rights of working people of, against slavery has been a struggle of both empathy and rationality, of, of connecting with people emotionally, thinking that I care, and also universalizing those ideas in laws and legal political systems and so on. Um, anyway, so that's my first answer to the question. It's a little bit of both, but maybe not the word benevolence. Watch out for paternalism. Really interesting question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Daiki. So. But I think that I answered it included my question, so. You can ask another question if you <laughs> like. <laughs> well, it is about the uh, you know, like every, uh, I'm standing low, so probably let think it's, uh, I think it's all like it all over the kind. The certain problems in, in the world that happens are, well, that is still justice, but probably that that's an answer. And, it, and the last question, it wasn't my answer out of a question, so. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, let's still have time. Okay, while well, 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 we wait for questions to come in, um, I'm actually wondering because uh, this is our last day of the conference and uh, one of the things that we really try to instill is a desire for we accumulate all that knowledge and then what do we do with it? And one of it is um, uh, the policymaking exercise. Uh, so in terms of, uh, of laws and policies and, and changes in, in, in culture and in the way we relate to each other, what kind of what kind of things would you like to see adopted um, within this context, UK, Japan, or, or, or globally, anywhere? What, what kind of things would you like to, what kind of changes would you like to see over the next few decades or, or centuries? I think one thing I'd like to see is a growing movement to criminalize ecocide. Some of you may know about the ecocide movement, which is to embed in international law the destruction of the planet as a crime against as a crime in the same way as a genocide as a crime against humanity and to use the international criminal court in the hague um there are there are people trying to campaign for this these are long-term campaigns um and even the international criminal court in the hague is not very good at bringing to justice people like in the from the wars in yugoslavia but i think any of you for example interested in law and studying th things related to law to think about ecocide i think that's a really important movement I think the other thing I'd like to see is outside the realm of politics, I think I've talked quite a bit about politics, but is to see the economic structural changes. Uh, um, now here's a book my grandfather gave me when I was 16, The Marxist Reader, okay? Now he was a member, of, my grandfather was a member of the Communist Party in Australia. I'm not. Um, of course, what you learn is if you change a society, you can't just change the politics, you must change the economic structures. That in a way, the politics and culture changes, particularly once you have transformed your economy. So, you know, once, you know, with the, with the shift from feudalism to industrialization in Europe, brought huge changes in gender and politics and all sorts of things. And I think this, we need to now make growth addicted economy to a regenerative economy economy that lives within the boundaries of the living. That's what donut economics is about, okay? So that model that I showed you of Kate Rareworth's donut economics model has been adopted in cities and, and countries around the world. In Amsterdam, for example, they've recently adopted the donut as the model of post-COVID recovery. Uh, in Copenhagen, it's being used. Costa Rica, it's being used. Cities across the US. So one of the things I'd really like to see happening is things like donor economics and other things like the circular economy movement, if you know about the circular economy movement, adopted and put into practice. Become part of it. But if you're going to get a job when you finish college, don't go and join an investment bank. Go and join a B corporation or a benefit corporation, which has ecological and social ambitions written into it. Get involved in the circular economy. You know, if you join, if you go and get a job at SoftBank, well, go in to the head of SoftBank and say, okay, you're looking 300 years ahead. 
but which generations? Who, who's going to benefit from the growth of this company? Is it for just the shareholders and your um, venture capital investors or for more than that? Thank you so much. Anne, the floor is yours. Um, hi. So, um, okay, um, there's like a guy who's delivering a who's coming to me. <laughs> no, I have to take that. But um, like my question is basically like based on my um, experience with the activism, I kind of, I had a lot of time feeling powerless because it's really, really um, hard to sort of continue doing something or um, you know, having more people to involved in your um, activism. So I, I, I want to ask, like, what is your advice in that? Like, how do we combat that feeling of powerlessness? That's a really great question, because the biggest challenge for social movements in the last century, when they've, since they've been developing, really, has been how do you maintain the energy of the movement? And if you read any book on the history of social movements, you'll see they all go up and down, up and down, up and down. You get waves of activism, literally because people's energy runs out. You saw that in the civil rights movement in the US, you saw it in the Occupy movement from 2011. You know, Extinction Rebellion uh, is trying to maintain, it knows about these issues very much and is trying to maintain that. Um, I think that, I think there's no great solution to that. Um, but I think the most fundamental one is to give people a sense of agency that their actions are making a difference. If you feel powerless, of course, you don't want to act. But then that just raises another question. How do you give people a sense of agency? As you're asking people like I am to change big systems to change laws, to change how a political system works, to change how an economy works, you know, that's easy to get exhausted <laughs> because it's so hard to see the results. And that's why I think, I mean, I'm just saying something obvious here, which is that we all need to be doing, operating on maybe two or three different levels. I think as activists on big scale, you know, those things where it's hard to see the results, but they do make a difference, but also, to be an activist in everyday life. So when you are shopping, when you're about to buy an avocado, ask yourself, am I being a good ancestor when I buy this? If this, and if this avocado has come from Peru in an airplane, you know, what will my ancestors think if I bought this <laughs> avocado from Peru? It's madness, right? Don't buy the avocado, put it back. And I think these things are empowering. And I think, you know, and then to share that, you know, with, with friends and with family and all that kind of thing. These are just like the small, if you vote. Let me just show you something from my book very quickly. If I can find it. Uh, you won't be able to see this very well, but this is from the end of the book is a menu of qu conversation questions. These are questions about the six different ways to think long term. So one of them is, for example, um, what legacy do you want to leave for your family, your community, and for the living world? Or under intergenerational justice, the question is, what for you are the most powerful reasons for caring about future generations? And the reason I raise that is that as an activist, I do believe that to change the world and to keep up your energy, it can, one of the ways you can get it is to have those conversations with people. Use those questions or questions like that to talk to on the bus, it gives amazing energy because you discover other people, different views. You are changing the world one person at a time. And for many years, I worked for an organization called the Oxford Muse. And we did what were called conversation meals. So we get a hundred business leaders with a hundred to invite them for lunch. A menu of food gave them a menu of conversation with questions about life on it. Like, what have you learned about love during your life? Or in what ways have, would you like to be more courageous? It was like the opposite of speed dating. You know, you'd speak for two hours, not for two minutes. But these conversations, I think, are a microcosmic form of change. And I think as an activist, I think talking, 
with people who are different from you, having the conversations with family who maybe see the world different from you is one way to keep your energy up. But I'm not saying this is easy. It's not. Uh, thank you so much for that. Avocado have had the very tough conference from us. They've been talked about in negative terms a lot of times. Uh, we'll take Angel and then Kanako. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. You've kind of touched on previously, um, but it's around if you have any recommendations or, or advice on how to approach and work with like local government and local groups in terms of implementing projects or uh, policy that relate to uh, sort of long-term thinking. Right. Um, I think the most important thing in this area is don't let anybody stop you doing anything. So, for example, let me let's give you an example of this. Um, in the UK, there is a campaign for the whole of the UK having a, a future generations commissioner like that they have in Wales that I mentioned earlier. And I've been working with um, a member of the House of Lords, Lord John Bird, who founded the Big Issue magazine, who's leading the campaign. And I said to him, I said, look, okay, you're trying to get this new commissioner, but if this fails, because it might not succeed, why don't we also have, create a future citizens assembly for the UK, um, Anyway, even if the government doesn't approve of it, and that assembly can have people from across the country who will have a discussion meeting every month or whatever for a year to talk about the long-term challenges we're facing. And they can write a report and issue it and so on. And if it's really cool, we'll get great media coverage for it, even if it's not official. official. So I think in terms of local action, these are the things you can just start doing. Um, you know, you can take that, Jap that Japanese future design model and just hold your own, just do it yourself, you know, invite people and then get the local newspapers to come and so on. And then, of course, ideally, then you want to invite along local councillors, local politicians, let them take part. And so I just think that one of these, you know, we're in this amazing moment of history where because of COVID-19, OK, on the street where I live in, in suburban Oxford on our street mostly people didn't normally speak to each other but as soon as COVID happened we set up a whatsapp group and there were immediately a hundred of us sharing recipes for bread delivering food um, I needed some Chinese calligraphy paint paint brushes because I wanted to teach my kids in five minutes I had two sets you know uh, if I'm thinking of your question Angel I think here we have these amazing resources you can immediately create an online community to do some of these a lot of the stuff that you want people are ready for it now they want it actually i think they want it again none of this stuff's easy but i think you've just got to start it you know even doing it your yourself um and 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 hook up with people in other places if you know you know one of the things like with amsterdam having become a donut economic city it's inspired other cities saying oh well if they can do it we can do it too there's a kind of a replication you know and they, so now the people from Amsterdam are helping the people in Copenhagen, right? So find your allies wherever they are in the world and they will help you. Uh, we hope that for your uh, community projects, you'll find allies within this conference as well. But um, for our last question, of the, uh, let's go to Kanako. Hello, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I think many climate skeptics or climate deniers also care about the future generation but they don't see the climate crisis or the climate change as real uh, in the scientific terms or from their own beliefs and in your opinion what do you think would be the best way to sort of engage those um, people who do care about their future generation but then they don't act or they don't show the sort of um, they don't put it in there into yeah. their action really difficult issue dealing with you know particularly climate uh, denial i mean what i have found is that that well on some level sometimes you just cannot reach them you know they are unreachable sometimes right and we just have to accept that but i think that and i and i agree certainly if you've got a climate denier in front of you trying to give them facts and figures 
does not work or it's very very rare people have our our psyche thing uh is our you know um what we are particularly good at as human beings and it's destructive my experience is that actually talking about legacy and future legacy and children and grandchildren is the most effective way that i've found of reaching those people it doesn't always work but one of the interesting things i've found talking to politicians on both the left and the right that the way when i do it i start talking about legacy i show them that image of that giant orange circle and i say look in there are your children and their children and their children going on and they're looking at you and they are judging you and how do you want to be remembered by them now i found that that can connect with people even people who don't want to hear the message and i think that kind of messaging is a bridge to then talking about you know the climate crisis or or something like that uh again it's not easy but i think you look at amazing example often you find again when i've spoken to politicians or people who are top ceos what they say is you know what really changed me it was my daughter it was my daughter said i can't talk to you about this dad you know uh you you know i'm ashamed of what you do i'm ashamed of you working for an oil com- a company and i think that changes people but again even many people will still deny that <laughs> you know so i know that's not a, um the best of answers let me say one other thing and this is a slightly different answer i went to a, a talk about talking to climate deniers by uh, an american um scientist climate scientist called catherine hayho h e y h o e some of you may know her she's brilliant she is very religious i think she's a baptist i think and so she is a member of the baptist community and the problem she found is that she'd often be talking to members of her religious community who are severe climate deniers and she's a climate she's a an ocean scientist or something like that or an atmospheric scientist and she's she tried anything like how do i connect with these people or she'd be talking to coal or oil company workers and they how do i connect with these people <laughs> you know this is impossible um and one of the things she said particularly about talking to the people from the oil and fossil fuel industry she said she said this is what i do this is her talking roughly she said when i do one of my talks the first thing i say to them is this i say you know i love fossil fuels i love them why because over the last 200 years they have given us amazing things they have given us roads and wealth and education and hospitals and technology and everything without fossil fuels we wouldn't have so much of what we have wow i love fossil fuels but now we know too much we also know that we can't do this the people in the 19th century didn't know about the impacts of their the fossil fuel economy but people today to do and we know we can't keep on with this same kind of economy so what we need to do is recognize that in the past love your fo- i love those fossil fuels for the future we can't love them any more you know and she says this is just that that is really effective that you kind of acknowledge something you're not you don't say to the other person you are wrong right you say to them you are right but there's more truth now you know or the truth is changing yeah i find that really powerful and i haven't practiced it a lot i have to admit i've I've started trying to use that approach but I think that's the kind of thing that might also work you know depending on what on the context that you're in isn't that smart do you think that's a really smart thing to do i mean i think it's brilliant um yeah, it, it yeah. changes the dynamic people no longer feel attacked oh. they're like you're, you're on the same team uh before we let you go roman um somebody in the group chat i think it was brahma uh who asked for your contact details for further questions yeah um so the best to the best way for me to answer questions is to write to me on twitter uh at, at roman krisnarik uh just my name or if you've got more detailed questions go to my website romankrisnarik.com and just fill out the contact form and i will get it there uh and i'll try to answer but i have to say i get a lot of <laughs> emails so if you really want an, a, a quick answer twitter i will always see it there um if you're willing to wait 
try my email. Um, but yeah, please do get in touch um, and, uh, and share more thoughts. And it's been really, really interesting hearing all your questions, such interesting, smart questions. Um, I'm really inspired. So um, I'm going to go and think about them more, particularly that one of that benevolence versus justice and uh, all of them, in fact. <laughs> Thank you so much for them for your generosity. Now I'll invite everyone to join me in clapping as much as our technology will allow. So I'll mute yourselves. And... Thank you very much. Uh, um, and thank you for listening. And thank you for getting up early or staying up late, depending where in the world you are. Thank you so much.